The day is March 8th, 1971. As Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier dance in the fight of the century, a journalist over at Reuters receives a mysterious phone call. A group, an activist group calling themselves the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI, had that same night broken into an FBI office in Pennsylvania. I know, who would have seen that coming? They informed the journalist that they'd retrieved evidence of a wide-reaching, illegal conspiracy within the borough to spy on, threaten, slander, wiretap, and systematically dismantle political organizations that the FBI didn't like. Now, the Reuters man was quite upset at the idea of the First Amendment not being real, so he hung up, as did pretty much every other news media organization that the group approached. None would touch this story with a 10-foot pole. Except the Washington Post for some reason, paving the way for yours truly to lament its existence over half a century later. From 1956 to 1971, the federal police weaponized the sweeping, unrelenting use of government informants and undercover cops to infiltrate left-wing political groups of all forms. They encouraged violence at their events in the hopes of incriminating members, they pitted factions within groups against one another, they planted fake stories about the organizations alongside their friends within the news media, and they conspired with local police units to take care of people they deemed subversive enough to deserve such a fate. One of these people was Fred Hampton, a Black Panther and community organizer from Illinois who believes in a multiracial, class-conscious, anti-racist political force. He was a founding member of the Rainbow Coalition, a political operation within Illinois at the intersection of race and class that successfully rejected the long-held gospel of the U.S.'s political scholars and analysts and media pundits that you either talk about class or you talk about race, never both and by uniting the Chicago chapter of the Black Panthers with the Young Lords, a Puerto Rico independence organization, and the Young Patriots, a group of white working-class civilians from the U.S. South. The Rainbow Coalition was able to pool resources and aid to provide a holistic agenda for the people of Chicago that the federal, state, and local governments never would. I'm talking free healthcare clinics. They treated people for sickle cell anemia and for other illnesses without overwhelming them with paperwork and bureaucracy. Legal aid and advice for tenants and for civilians dealing with tyrannical police officers, a roster of motivated lawyers to represent working people in the courts, and most famously, a free breakfast program that at its peak fed 20,000 kids with meals they otherwise never would have had at a time when hunger and poverty infamously made it impossible for many black, brown, and poor white children in Chicago to focus and study in school. Now, the feds didn't like this very much. What they saw was a class coalition that was building popular support within Chicago, and that was also able to look beyond the narrative of race and racism preferred by the US government. The free breakfast program was the biggest terror, a uniquely evil threat they saw it as because of the social goodwill it was building within Illinois for people that the FBI saw as dangerous racial agitators. Hampton was becoming inconvenient to that narrative. And in December 1969, at the turn of the decade, Hampton was drugged in a Chicago apartment by his trusted friend, snitch, and undercover cop, William O'Neill, paving the way for a tactical unit at the Cook County State Attorney's Office to fire a hundred rounds into his residence, killing Hampton, his friend and fellow Panther Mark Clark, while also injuring several others within the housing unit. The federal police gave the State Attorney's Office the floor plan of Hampton's apartment to ensure that the murder went smoothly. He was 21 years old. Fast forward about 10 years or so, and now Governor Ronald Reagan is being sworn in as President of the United States. There is of course no mention of Fred Hampton in the speech, nor would there ever be, for any major presidential candidate to come. A jury would confirm the fates of Hampton and Clark as unprovoked, but also as undeserving of any real legal consequences beyond a fine. And while the presidential choir sung their hearts out for their new king, the state forces that worked to snuff out people's based political organizations in the crib were only about to become stronger than they'd ever been. Ours was the first revolution in the history of mankind that truly reversed the course of government. We the people tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We the people are free. Neoliberal populism isn't its own ideology or model of governance. It's a form of socio-political rhetoric that casts challenges to neoliberal politics and economics as not necessarily against the interests of the wealthy and well-connected, but definitely against the interests of the everyday people that the programs created by public investment would service. It is, in essence, the communications arm of neoliberal interests, the method by which they sell their pitch to the public, 
And in selling their pitch, neoliberal populism has been central to cementing a right-wing hegemony and status quo within the USA's national politics, discourse, and economy from the 1970s to today. Alright, that's a lot, I get it, so let me break it all down a bit. When I say a right-wing status quo has dominated America's politics and economy, there are many people who would disagree, especially conservatives, many of whom believe that leftists have taken over international institutions, let alone those of the USA. This is in spite of the fact that within the country, there is zero, and I mean zero conception of class consciousness as an acceptable cultural value, which in of itself would be essential to any mainstream leftist coalition. Nor is there any semblance of decolonization of the indigenous nations, any major public distribution of resources such as universal health care, national infrastructure projects, robust public transportation, organized efforts to eradicate poverty, homelessness, or public pensions that remain reliable over the long term, trade unions as a strong social institution, the advancement of black, indigenous economy, housing, social stability, and employment in high-paying sectors, and of course the logistical, political, and fundraising organizations needed to successfully implement such policy. This agenda I've just laid out for you, an alternative to the never-ending hot potato of liberal conservative politics, is spit on by the USA's political discourse and is held in complete contempt by the news media, that being right-wing media and liberal media, the president, the Supreme Court, an overwhelming majority of the federal legislature on a bipartisan basis, a vast degree of many of the state-level legislatures and governor's mansions, and the donors that bankroll their campaigns. American Carnage too goes unquestioned within any White House, Congress, or media organization. We don't do that CIA. now, though. We don't mess around other people's well, elections. Yeah. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> <laughs> Only for a very good Can cause. Can you do that? Do a Vine video on a former CIA director. Only for a very good cause in okay. the interest of democracy. All right, thanks for being here. You will never see a presidential candidate, not even the one alleged truth bomber, say out loud that the United States government knew the Contras were shoveling crack into the country in the 80s and not only did nothing to stop them from poisoning their own citizens with a nightmare drug, but instead actively sending them more funds and resources. God forbid any campaign stop of theirs mention Quintel Pro, Fred Hampton, and the violent criminal collusion of local police departments with the feds. The day a presidential candidate mentions the, the U.S. deep state's criminal coups, aided overthrows, and destruction of duly elected leftist leaders in countries like Chile, Guatemala, is the day a Canadian is called a citizen by law, rather than a loyal subject of the king. Indigenous political candidates are cut out of the system entirely. There is zero recognition of decolonization within the U.S. judiciary or its politics. Nor is there any political representation for even just the nations on reserve, who by themselves encompass a landmass bigger than the 12th largest state, a pan-Indigenous identity formed by common experience with the settlers, and a population of one and a half million, more people than the states of Vermont and Alaska combined. There are pan-Indigenous movements and organizations, but the substantive issues of crime and economy faced by their millions go completely ignored by the political culture. The most you'll get is a CNN article here or there talking about self-government. But the presidential campaigns, the things that matter, never even sees a discussion of these nations actually governing their land and running their own institutions in ways that would dramatically reduce crime, entrench sky-high inflation, and tremendously strengthen their own industry. And the sole reason these issues are not discussed in the mainstream is because they are politically incorrect to discuss, with a bipartisan foundation ensuring that this is so. There is no nationally organized left in the USA, on a substantive level and as a viable alternative to the dichotomy of liberal conservative politics. It simply doesn't exist. Now it should be obvious, right, that these assumptions underlying the US's political discourse aren't simply a product of the last 50 years. A fiscal and monetary policy designed for the owners of capital and against the owners of labor and the brutalism of white hegemony have been assumed as the default going back to the country's founding. But ever since the 1970s and the global growth of neoliberalism, another assumption has been introduced as a default. That being that the social contract between the US state and the citizenry has to be dysfunctional, antagonistic, underfunded, and corrupt at every single turn. It must provide a poor return on tax revenue, and it must provide for the building of an antagonistic and violent security state, both of which can then work in tandem with each other to accomplish neoliberal goals, one of which being fostering distrust among the citizenry within the institutions around them. The motivation for instilling this distrust in public institutions is that it paves the way for private institutions to take the social contract's place within people's everyday lives. 
products. It paves the way for the formation of unquestioned markets and profit motives to form within every facet of society, from healthcare, housing, and transportation, to food, pensions, even the legal system itself. This isn't too much of a problem for the wealthy. They can buy all the health insurance they want, and of course they don't need to worry about affordable housing. It is, however, an issue for anybody who's never spent thousands of dollars on fish eggs. The third assumption that the social contract has to suck for everybody, and there's not a thing anybody can do about it, this is new. It's what differentiates the modern right-wing regime of the United States from its past iterations. This third assumption is what gives the neoliberal populist pitch the final iota of credibility needed to truly shine in the eyes of the public. I'm gonna get into specifics, but for now, the fundamentals of its pitch is that public services are part of the inner workings of a leftist elite looking to expand the state's control over the individual and your freedom. You are the everyday working man, woman, and everybody in between, just trying to earn an honest living, while they want to grab that living for themselves so that they can expand their own control over your healthcare, your favorite oil companies, and to punish individual success, leaving you physically and ideologically dependent on the state. The neoliberal populist rhetoric seeks to persuade the public that economic prosperity and strong protections for individual rights such as protections from self-incrimination, unreasonable search, the right to a fair trial, free speech, freedom of religion, and the right to bodily autonomy, that these rights and successes are incompatible with ending poverty and not going bankrupt over your medical bills, smearing any and all public investment regardless of its nature as a tyrannical scheme masquerading as good faith all while operating a true tyrannical scheme on the side, with a violently authoritarian police and prison state created to protect the interests of neoliberal policy, in particular property, capital, and white hegemony. Now, what I said before was a lot. This is at least two. I've got a lot of proving to do here with the massive claims that I've just laid out. So let's get into it. Let's talk about neoliberal dominance in the minds and the laws of the most influential country in global geopolitics, a dominance that really began to show its sleeve in the 1970s. The 70s were a time. They were definitely a time. The USA's cultural growth in this time was fairly sweeping. The film and music divisions of its life were thriving. The birth decade of the integrated circuit and microprocessor, one of the most important inventions in human history, along with the fiber optic cable, the theory of black holes, the World Trade Center. But back on Earth, nobody cared because, right, inflation. Inflation does have something Inflation to do ain't bothering Biggie Smalls and his boys in Kentucky and Alabama. An inflationary spiral overtook the entire decade. For the first and only time in the country's modern history, an entire decade of the complete and utter debauchment of the dollar. A couple years of eight 9% inflation is really bad, but a decade culminating in double digits? Pure dystopia. Typically, inflation is understood to accompany strong economic growth, which can in some respect ease the pain, albeit slightly. But in the case of the seven news, three bad recessions throughout the decade and unemployment sticking near its ceiling for the whole of it. Now, the state of an economy parallels the state of its society. Whether or not people feel that the initial conditions of their day-to-day -day lives are improving is a question that fundamentally nearly every individual wants to say yes to. And the US economy of the 70s was unable to provide anything close to this vision, defined by inflation, unemployment, and a long shadow over the national self-esteem of the country as a consequence. This shadow was lengthened and strengthened even more so by the trauma of Watergate first time in U.S. history that the citizenry by and large were forced to reckon with the fact that the president was a criminal. Now, don't get it twisted, right? Nixon was never the only criminal president, nor was he the worst president, not even close to either of those things. But he was, as of today, the only one who has ever resigned in disgrace. Essentially the closest thing to an admission of guilt that we've ever seen from one of them boys. Many people tend to describe the 80s as the beginning of neoliberal dominance in the U.S. In reality, the 70s was its true beginning as the foundation for what was to come. It was late in this decade. Not only were people of all social stratas fed up with business as usual, increasing popular demand for new socioeconomic paradigms, but this demand itself was already being met well before the neolibs of the 80s. Nixon signed a drug scheduling act, paving the way for, you guessed it, the war on drugs, one of the strongest vessels for police state expansion to form ever. A vessel that over the next few decades would also happen to be exceptionally well equipped for the protection and service of capital and property over people. 
Meanwhile, a guidebook on how to incentivize citizens and governments to adopt neoliberal norms was put on full display in 1973, when the duly elected first ever leftist president of Chile, Salvador Allende, was deposed in a military coup. At the peak of a multi-year economic warfare waged on Chile by President Nixon, who in 1971, after Allende's election, directed his government to quote, make their economy scream. A pro-US right-wing dictatorship led by General Augusto Pinochet was then established, a dictatorship quickly recognized by the US and its allies as the proper state of Chile. Now, the Chile predicament is a video in its own right. You know, I don't want y'all to think that I'm downplaying its significance by only giving it a small sliver of time in this video. Chile also wasn't the first coup backed by the US government, not even close. The reason I mention it here and now is because the rise of Pinochet served as one of the first explicit neoliberal state formations in the world. Meanwhile, back on Turtle Island, there was never a need to use deep state goons to depose the US politicians standing against neoliberal interests. Some may say President Jimmy Carter was one of these politicians, but those who believe this are often those who define leftism as a caricature of character traits they don't like. Carter was pacifistic, incompetent at taming inflation, and a democrat, therefore he's left wing. Despite him never once calling for any major challenge to private markets, any decolonial project, any fiscal policy geared towards the mass of his society. And so there was never a need, never a necessity, to disrupt the illusion of civility within Washington that the USA's politicians clutch close to their chest to this day. Consent for their neoliberal state could instead be manufactured. All in all, the 70s for the Yankees, a miserable, innovative time is the best way I can describe it. And the demand for an alternative was there. But the populistic twist to neoliberalism wasn't yet in place, the final piece of the puzzle. The way that neoliberal populism truly got off the ground was when it attached itself to another resentment of the 70s, a resentment that was bubbling over in a big way. You said, Mr. Robson, and I quote, I belong to the American resistance movement which fights against American imperialism, just as the resistance movement fought against Hitler. Just like Close Frederick quote. Douglass and Harriet Tubman were underground railroaders and fighting for our freedom, you bet your life. I have to insist that you listen to these questions. I am listening. Now, what prejudice are you talking about? You were graduated from Rutgers, you were graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. I remember seeing you play football at Lehigh. There was no prejudice against you. Just a moment. This is something I challenge very deeply, that the success of a few Negroes can make up for $700 a year for thousands of Negro families in the South. White America felt very strongly that the country was slipping away from their control in the 70s. Millions of civilians, whose attitudes towards race in the 70s weren't all that different from those of the 50s, were now huddled around their televisions during prime time, only to see black youth and congregations rallying for their political aims, creating organizing and fundraising efforts for these causes for the first time since Reconstruction. They saw white youth join their side, and they had never seen anything like it. All of this after generations of their favorite politicians at every level of government and from every party, from Washington and Adams, acknowledging that the ownership of other human beings based on race was abhorrent, while also casting the quick abolition of one of the most violent, thuggish, and traumatic racial hierarchies to ever exist in human history, as a greater threat to the values of justice and humanity than the hierarchy itself, from Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln having a civil, polite debate complete with jokes and banter and applause of whether black civilians should be considered partly human or not human at all, to Goldwater and Wallace casting minuscule progress towards equity between black and white life as a slippery slope down a spiral of tyranny. The message was clear throughout generations, their liberation should infuriate you, it is a threat to you, and never ever let anybody tell you otherwise. Now, when discussing liberation in the context of enabling vast socioeconomic opportunities that were previously disabled or out of reach for the masses of a particular population or segment, from that definition, the 70s was not a major empowerment for black America by any stretch. Even the 60s, a decade often heralded as the greatest decade for racial equity since Reconstruction, that's more so an indictment of, you know, just how badly the cause for emancipation stagnated once Reconstruction ended. Beyond new voting protections, which were quite substantial, the overwhelming majority of the black population in the 60s saw few improvements in their housing and employment opportunities relative to the white population, apart from the kids in Illinois living under the Rainbow Coalition. 
The rise they did see an opportunity in the 60s stopped dead in its tracks once the 70s came by, as rampant entrenched double-digit inflation whittled away the prospect of real growth in their earnings and resources. But that isn't what white America saw. What they saw was the dissolution of the evil Jim Crow regime, the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board of Education, and President Kennedy paying lip service to black civilians in a state of the Union. And the tragic truth is that millions of them were infuriated by these developments. I'm going to come back to this discussion in a bit, but for now, with all of that together, we've got a, something of a backdrop of the 70s in the U.S. Cultural growth, economic misery, three faces of the nation, each of which made the country seem rudderless and weak in their own unique ways, and a growing resentment towards both real and perceived gains in civil and economic success for millions of people who had been forcibly relegated to the outskirts of U.S. society. Somebody had to come in and seize the moment. Do you see yourself as the only hope of the conservatives in the party? They certainly are not going to rally around Nelson Rockefeller, and many of them may not around Richard Nixon. Where else do they have to go except to you? Out with the emancipation movements, in with the moral panics, here comes the 80s, the decade in which neoliberalism truly began to spread like butter across global finance, commerce, trade, and geopolitics. And at the forefront of this change, the new POTUS. Now, many folks credit Ronaldo Regano's government with the ushering of neoliberalism in the U.S., but as we just saw, the seeds of neolib had been planted well before he was even a governor. Had Reagan never been president, it's not that neoliberalism wouldn't have taken over U.S. politics, it absolutely still would have. Indeed, the true arbiter of Ron's legacy isn't that he ushered in an era of neoliberalism, but that he wrote the playbook for neoliberal populism, the exact kind of rhetoric and talk needed to establish neoliberalism as a hegemony, rather than just an alternative out of several different ideas. This is rarely talked about, Reagan's overwhelming populistic appeal, and we're gonna do it now, starting with my favorite thing to ever exist, the economy. The US economy of the 80s was and still is cast as mourning in America, and there are reasons for why people think this way. For the first time in 10 years, the masses of the country no longer had to face consistently soaring prices everywhere they looked. Job growth returned, inflation fell, the great stagnation was over, while the widespread adoption of new technologies such as the personal computer created vast new opportunities in employment. The information economy was born. Through this success, what most of the public saw was that after one dose of tax cuts for the wealthy and deregulation of industry at the hands of their new boy, the economy came roaring back to life, while innovative new technologies changed their lives. It wasn't hard for many people to associate Ronnie's fiscal policy with sweeping economic success. It did not hurt that the man himself was an endearing, likable figure. Charismatic, he came off as a wise grandpa in his manner of speech and his outward character, self-deprecating in a danger-field kind of way. And so, with a growing economy under his belt, a likable personality, and being one of the only two Republicans in history who've ever figured out how to be funny, Reagan became overwhelmingly popular among the general public. He won re-election big, 525-13, Walter didn't stand a chance. Just look at that all-American smile. With all of that in mind, the Reagan story seems to be an overwhelming win from top to bottom, a popular president who turned his country's economic misfortune around. But there's a theme on this channel that we've explored really in every video I've made thus far, the notion of things not being what they seem to be on the surface. To the casual eye, it did look like morning in America in the 80s, but behind the glaze was a dystopia brewing beneath the surface. <clears throat> Reagan did not perfect the populist spin on neoliberal ideals that wouldn't come until the next decade, but his promo skills were solid, and he knew it. Nearly every speech the man gave was one hammering into the minds of anybody who would listen that freedom from tyranny, something that every American is taught to desire from a young age, will always, always coincide with the fiscal policy that directs an increasing share of the M2 monetary supply to the wealthiest of the wealthy. And by endlessly forming this connotation through his words, within a society that has always been taught to associate immense wealth with morality, a gift from God for the good and pious, and his status as the president, somebody that the people of the country would want to look up to, want their kids to look up to, put all that together, and the culture began to love on Reagan's fiscal policy, unaware at that time of its long-term consequences. Exhibit A, manufacturing, the backbone of any industrialized society from the day Reagan was sworn in to the day he left office. The USA lost a net half a million manufacturing jobs. 
Reagan accelerated a progressive collapse of the U.S. factory, the strength of the country's manufacturing base, and its institutional ability to manage the problems of its millions of workers and localities that depended on such industry, all in the pursuit of one goal, greater returns for the shareholders of manufacturing firms. The Reagan ricks of the world would argue this industrial decay was a product of broader economic trends, you know, inevitable with or without Ronaldo. It is true that no matter who was president, a net amount of industrial jobs were going to leave the country in the 80s as globalization began to change the game for labor costs. But never let anybody convince you that it had to be this bad, as it took both Reagan's endless faith in the free market as well as his sweeping adoption of quote-unquote free, tariffless trade to really shoot a bullet into the US's industrial sector. With the widespread growth of investing in capital markets in the 80s, the US manufacturing world began moving away from domestically situated models of enterprise. They began outsourcing everything they didn't absolutely need to do themselves in order to make their firms more compelling as financial instruments for investors to hold as assets. But this was also a much larger problem than, you know, the forte of whoever the president was. What was 100% in Reagan's control was this new day of sweeping tariffless trade that his regime had established. Now those manufacturing firms could export their capital, labor, and factories across the globe in pursuit of their offshoring goals at little to no additional expense. First, Reagan clinched a deal with Palestine, then Canada, followed by him starting the Uruguay Round, a conference aimed at expanding free trade among over 50 nations, and finally laying the groundwork for NAFTA, which would later be signed into law by Reagan Light, excuse me, Bill Clinton. In recent years, the trade deficit led some misguided politicians to call for protectionism, warning that otherwise we would lose jobs. But they were wrong again. The record is clear that when America's total trade has increased, American jobs have also increased. This was a major mistake on Ronald's part. His unquestioned obedience to trade liberalization. After all, the man understood the harm that free trade can inflict on domestic industry, otherwise he wouldn't have actively made exemptions for Japanese steel imports that were integral to keeping Harley Davidson in a flow throughout the 80s. But beyond these piecemeal exemptions, Reagan established a precedent of nearly universal tariffless trade of goods whenever possible, particularly through his most powerful weapon, his rhetoric. If all the man did was simply call for further exemptions for, say, the broader auto industry, fabricated metals, and machinery construction, he could have protected millions of additional jobs for the low-wage labor force while also strengthening the long-term resilience of U.S. supply chains. In addition, Ronnie could have protected the manufacturing base by creating what's called a national industrial policy, that being federal funds and resources that would strongly incentivize firms to produce their goods in the USA, update their US plant and equipment, and extend pay and benefits for the US workers. If he had done either of those things, much less both, without a shadow of a doubt his society's industrial sector would be worlds more powerful and resilient today. He did neither. In fact, he actively saw such policy as state management of the economy. And so, not only did the country's industrial sector lose jobs on a net basis during one of its strongest long-term periods of job growth, but this decline would only accelerate as the politicians to come followed Ronald's lead on both trade and a lack of a federal industrial policy. Indeed, it wasn't until Donald and Brandon that the Reagan orthodoxy surrounding trade and federal investments in employment would finally see any sort of challenge. But too little too late, as with this industrial decline, also came a new age of right-wing politicians urging their constituents that their jobs would remain protected if only the free market was allowed to do its thing, creating a homunculus of lies and contradiction in the process as the same free market continued to be a major factor not only behind the offshoring itself, but also behind the inability to replace their lost work with new industries and economic renewal, as American firms have demonstrated a sweeping resistance to entering these localities and creating employment without federal or state contracts as an incentive. Pretending to be these voters as friends, appealing to their distrust in government as a consequence of seeing their economies decay over decades while the state sat on their hands, smiling in their face and stabbing them in the back. With this industrial decline also came a permanent drop in the social and political power of the lower wage labor force who depended on these drops, creating even more room for powerful business interests to carve out their ever-growing stake of the global superpowers politics. This room was then expanded even further by Ronald changing the game for organized labor, one of the strongest obstacles available to protect workers from offshoring. He changed his game through one particular example he set, one of the most brazen acts of domestic class warfare by the US state in modern history, 
when Reagan fired 15,000 air traffic controllers two days after they began striking due to abysmal pay and working conditions, banning them from ever working for the federal government ever again. The message was clear, try to deny selling your labor until you're being treated fairly and you will be crushed, while the people, the public, will take my side. Message received. Not only was Reagan's response to the strike overwhelmingly popular, but it set an example for the business world to follow, as they bared witness to exactly how their labor forces could be forced into submission, should they ever expect more than the bare minimum. American business leaders were given a lesson in managerial leadership by Reagan that they could not and did not ignore. Many private sector executives have told me that they were able to cut the fat from their organizations and adopt more competitive work practices because of what the government did in those days. From 49 to 79, there were over 200 major worker strikes in the USA per year. During every single one of those years, the final year of Reagan's second term, there were 40. Come 2017, there were seven. While the growth of American unions had begun to stagnate in the decades prior, union membership fell off a cliff from the year Reagan took office. Even with a recent resurgence in media coverage of strikes, union membership hit an all-time low in 2022, an ominous and sad 9%. You may be wondering, how was Reagan able to fundamentally cripple the strength of the labor unions, the American industrial sector, and the lower wage labor force, and not only grow more popular, but to still see working people show up by the droves to fill in his name at the ballot box? This is where Ronnie's populistic appeal comes back into play. During his speech excoriating the striking air traffic controllers, Reagan lamented his support for unions in the private sector just not the public sector, creating space for voters to believe that, hey, this guy's still on the side of the everyman and every woman, he just doesn't want to see the government workers get greedy, playing back into his eternal stump speech of every facet of government, including its rank and file employees making 30 grand a year, as greedy bureaucrats looking to rob you dry of your hard-earned dough. It didn't help that the man endlessly cast investment in public health care, transportation, and a national industrial policy, all of which could help offset industrial decay, as a Trojan source for authoritarianism, implicitly leading the citizenry towards supporting the replacement of these institutions with market-based controls and intervention within their everyday lives. Market controls that also just so happen to support business interests having free reign and access over the global economy, free of any pushback from local unions, tariffs, or employees. But you see, there's one key element to the success of Reagan's rhetoric that we really haven't gone over thus far. The missing link that was instrumental in making neoliberal populism the dominant narrative of US politics by uniting the business class of the country and many of the more liberal, affluent folks of that world with both the conservative base of the Republican Party and much of the white working class, people whose economic interests were being dismantled by Reagan, but who were given a convenient boogeyman as to why this was. Last night, I tell you, to watch that thing on television, and I, they did. Yeah? To see those, those monkeys from those African countries. <laughs> Damn them, they're still uncomfortable wearing shoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then they, the tail wags the dog there, doesn't it? Yeah. I spoke earlier about resentment, the one feeling behind so much of the USA's racial regime over the years. I am white and I want my rights. And how this resentment formed as a consequence of centuries of racial politics, economics, and social norms hammering into white families and communities that black empowerment was a threat to their very existence. And the segment of the country feeling this resentment to the fullest were Ronald's people through and through, the same tens and tens of millions of voters who backed Barry Goldwater during the 1964 presidential election. A man who believed in the allure of small government and states' rights over any federal action to dismantle a racial regime founded on terrorism, bloodshed, property destruction, kangaroo courts, and enshrining the repulsive concept of racial inferiority into law. Millions of people who supported and stood by and applauded George Wallace, governor of Alabama in 1963, when he stood in front of the entrance to the University of Alabama and physically prevented black students from entering the integrated school. The millions who for decades on end voted for scores and scores of politicians across the federal and state levels who would vow to embolden and strengthen the country's racial hierarchy as a central function of U.S. law and politic. Who are we to tell a state that they may not pass segregation laws? Voting for one segregationist and white supremacist after the other. Just 17 years after George Wallace stood in front of the University of Alabama, these people were still very much around, eager to vote. And vote they did for Ronald Reagan. Now, Ronald was not a dumb person. 
All right, you can call him a lot, you can't call him stupid. He knew exactly who these people were, what they wanted, and he delivered for them. Big. Reagan emboldened the scourge of racism in every facet of American life, and through his rhetoric justifying these actions, he also demonstrated for everybody to see how policies aimed at ending poverty and increasing the wealth and resources of the masses are cast along racial lines by the ruling party to unite the white population against them, including the enormous white population that such policies would work in favor of. As you see, with many of the changes of the Reagan presidency, also came an active, conscious shift in policy to focus cash assistance and benefits programs on the non-working poor, while defunding benefits for the working poor. In the first two years of the Ronald Reagan, out of half a million quote-unquote families with earnings receiving benefits from the AFDC, America's major cash benefit structure, the man eliminated or significantly reduced payments to 90% of these families. Nine out of every ten were no longer being compensated for their non-livable wages, and since AFDC enrollees also received Medicaid coverage well before the Affordable Care Act mandated employee-based health care coverage, those families all lost their health care as well. Affordable healthcare. This change targeted workers already within the loosest band of the labor market, as alongside Reagan's union busting, his disdain for an industrial policy, and his commitment to globalization and free unregulated trade, the American lower wage workforce already seeing vastly declining leverage to negotiate their wages, were now also suddenly getting left with no more health insurance or free meals to feed their children with, courtesy of Reagan's cuts. I don't say that the man waged your class warfare for no reason. Now as we keep getting back to the method by which he sold his welfare policy to the public, this continued chipping away at the lower wage labor market was by lying about a mentally ill black woman, one Linda Taylor, in every single stump speech the man could muster. Leading up to the 1980 election, he told crowds across the country of a woman who scammed the federal government out of 150 grand, using 80 different aliases to commit this welfare fraud. This was a lie. In reality, Linda stole 5% of what Reagan accused her of, and evidence in court revealed that she struggled to truly know what she was doing or even know who and where she was. Linda was an incredibly troubled person psychologically and didn't seem to be able to understand the conceptions of true and false, nor the consequences of her actions. Linda Taylor did seek to fraud the government, but that 150 grand figure Reagan cited. That is what got the gasps and the jeers at the rallies going, living a lavish six-figure lifestyle in the 80s, all off the taxpayers' dime. It didn't matter that her story was, at its core, a propaganda piece, highly, highly exaggerated and meant to paint the overwhelming majority of civilians on welfare, who never even came close to committing fraud, as criminals, or at the very least associate them with criminality in the minds of the public. What did matter is that the image cast by Reagan, played directly into the age-old stereotype and caricature of a black woman dependent on the state. And by casting this image, Reagan was able to shift the perception of cash assistance and benefits programs away from its post-Great Depression norm of laborers having fallen on hard times and towards crime, mental illness, and black womanhood. Public opinion on welfare followed, paving the way for a continued uncontroversial war on the poor well after Reagan left office. And let's shame the people who are creating jobs rather than, you know, shaming the people who are saving welfare. Talk about what the welfare state has created. Let's talk about the moral decay. Don't feed the alligators. But this, is, this guy is a parasite. That's the right. rat life, you That's know, right. entails a lot of different things. What if, what if we just cut off the unemployment? Hunger, of is a, it, hunger is a pretty powerful thing. And they only feed a military dog at night because a hungry dog is an obedient dog. But of course, this racial connotation was implicit. Reagan never said the words welfare queen out loud. Not even once he let the media do that for him. Instead, Reagan rationalized his policy with what has since become the standard neoliberal populist spin. A colorblind case of public programs forming a cycle of dependence on government, and that by eliminating welfare and encouraging people to work, they'd be able to help themselves rather than the state. I think the Republican diagnosis was accurate that there were way too many moms on welfare. If they would get jobs, it would be better for them. Except again, the rhetoric never matches up with the reality. Reagan's cuts targeted the working poor, while a 1984 study commissioned by the Gerald Ford Foundation found that far from bringing people out of poverty, Reagan's cuts forced particularly single mothers in America deeper into debt and poverty than they otherwise would have ever gone. This wouldn't have been as destructive had cuts to welfare come with investments in jobs and employment 
But they didn't rig and cut those two. He abolished a USA's one public service employment program, which provided work for the unemployed within nonprofits and in the public sector. He cut the work incentive program, a leg of the AFDC, that provided aid in job searches and jobs training for workers on the program. In total, $140 billion worth of cuts to the social contract in Reagan's first two years. Cuts to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the AFTC, and the elimination of one million free school lunches for poor children. The success of the Rainbow Coalition, now just a distant memory. And finally, moving past this aggravation of American poverty, we get to the very last building block to neoliberal populism. An overwhelming expansion of the power and jurisdiction of the police and prison state, funded through debt and deficit spending as opposed to raising revenue. It's important to remember that while neoliberal pundits and ideologues love to talk of the importance of small government, in practicality neoliberal politicians have always, always worked against their school by appropriating trillions and trillions of dollars worth of funds for the sole purposes of controlling the domestic population. This control manifests not through taxes, but through the threat of being pistol whipped by the boys in blue, who, especially during this time, would have had the full weight and support of the federal government, the news media, and the US deep state behind them should any suspicion arise as to their motivations. The motives for this expansion are complex, but they can best be summed up as the state playing its only expected role within a right-wing neoliberal regime setting up a police, military, and legal apparatus that can protect the interests of the private markets and of capital at any expense. In growing this system, Reagan simply picked up where Nixon left off with the war on drugs. He spearheaded the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984 through Congress, which established harsh federal penalties for the possession of loud, aka marijuana, and abolished parole for any and all federal prisoners post-87. It passed with strong, bipartisan support. He oversaw a major expansion of the federal prison system to account for all these new possessions-based felons, and in true neoliberal fashion, he introduced a profit motive to the legal system. He heavily expanded the role of the private sector in administering criminal justice, creating a financial incentive to keep all the new penitentiaries full. All of these changes were backed and consolidated by a freshly right-wing Supreme Court and federal judiciary created by Reagan's judicial appointments, chock full of government lawyers, many of whom were more than happy to hand down multi-decade sentences for 19-year-olds with some weed in their pocket. Indeed, despite violent crime climbing by 15% within the U.S. from 1980 to 1988, the U.S. prison population grew by 200% in this We've time. Gone through just an explosion of jail and prison construction in this country, costing us billions and billions of dollars to build and billions and billions of dollars to operate. The overwhelming majority of these inmates were black men, and it showed. From 1970 to 1980, the entirety of the lost decade, the number of black children born out of wedlock and living in a home headed by a single parent grew from 4.5% of black youth to 13% over 10 years. It would take another 5 years of Reagan, half that time, for that proportion to double. 26%, one in every 4 American black children in 1985 lived in such a home. Think about that, the black family unit buckled more during the economic boom of the Reagan years than they did during the economic misery and stagflation of the 70s. In addition, Reagan's government criminalized and prosecuted crack to hell and back, whose users and abusers were overwhelmingly black, while the drug's near identical analog of powder cocaine, whose users were overwhelmingly white and wealthy at the time, saw nothing close to the same attention of the law in the 80s. And that is the last motive for the police and prison state's expansion, the maintenance of white hegemony and white dominance in a manner that both appeals to white voters and that avoids allegations of racism through what appears on the surface to be a colorblind approach to justice. After all, the populistic pitch for the police state was that Reagan's policies were about being tough on crime, about keeping the masses of America safe against the rogue menaces of society that was the lurking drug dealer or carjacker, and that if you weren't a no-good criminal, you had nothing to fear. The colorblind pitch played. It was a political winner among Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, then and now, while slowly but surely, any whisper of a left-wing force still left in the U.S. at this juncture conceded the discussion surrounding crime, race, prisons, and police entirely towards the right. 
And whether or not some leftists agree or disagree with me, I do believe in punitive measures for a whole number of violent crimes, especially crimes of power, murder, sex abuse, child abuse, domestic abuse, bureaucratic crimes such as political corruption, bribery. Indeed, many of these groups I've just listed, such as sex abusers and corrupt politicians, have never been held accountable in the way they should by the US legal system. On the other hand, Reagan and his conservatives had nothing to say about the threat to calm, stable social organization that poverty creates, how it not only rips families apart through a greater likelihood of domestic conflict and outright violence, but how it exacerbates the risk of substance abuse and of increasing one's criminal contacts four strongly documented risk factors for criminal behavior. Reagan had nothing to say about fixing crumbling schools and community services in low-income neighborhoods with federal resources dedicated to such problems snuffed out under his presidency, leaving millions of kids without any positive diversions away from neighborhood gangs, nor the senseless violence that comes with so many of them, a problem that would grow to a gargantuan size throughout the 80s and 90s as it came to act as a core piece of the slow and steady co-option of youth into crime. Through the countless criminal influences that millions of kids in these neighborhoods encounter throughout their childhoods and adolescence, as often the only broad images of community cohesion that they see. Nothing about decriminalizing possession. Hell, Reagan did the opposite and oversaw the major expansion of possessions-based charges and convictions, creating a vicious cycle of putting addicts in cages, with hundreds of thousands of Americans still locked up on nothing but possessions charges to this day, and with a drug charge and a prison sentence on their record, leaving them unable to find employment or integrate back into society after finishing their sentence, pushing them deeper into crime than they otherwise would have ever gone. At every single turn, Reagan aggravated and emboldened the socioeconomic rut that fosters crime, that fosters violent crime, and that if addressed wouldn't account for all the crime that is, but would wage a war on crime in its own right and reduce the social ill significantly. Instead, Reagan worked against all of these goals, casting these policies as big government handouts or as lenience towards evil doers, using or lying about the most extreme, isolated examples to paint millions and millions of people living in poverty as crooks, people who wouldn't even be in poverty any longer had the USA's public resources been expanded rather than defunded and abolished. While allegations that this aggravation of poverty and of the police state kept many, many black Americans trapped in a vicious cycle of dystopia, where a stable family unit and positive diversions away from countless criminal influences were overwhelmed by the complete and utter abandonment of institutional support for these causes, leaving babies born in neighborhoods where gunshots are heard on an hourly basis in the hands of nothing but their immediate, volatile, and violent surroundings. All such allegations were met with scorn, disdain, and laughter. President Reagan wasn't the first guy to buy the neoliberal pitch or to sell it, both in the US or across the globe. But his revolution established it within the global superpowers politics as a bipartisan status quo. His sweeping electoral wins, along with his sky-high approval ratings, sent a message to other politicians, not just in the US, but also aspiring so-called left-wing politicians in Canada that the Reagan vision was the recipe for political power. By presiding over a nominally strong economy with enough beneficiaries to suppress electoral attention paid to its long-term instability, by pitting race and class against each other through both his rhetoric and policy, thereby stunting the rise of any peoples' base solidarity, by defunding freight rail, health insurance, job growth, meal plans, by normalizing a now endless bipartisan use of debt to expand the U.S. states' coercive control, by telling the people that government is the problem and then going out of his way to prove it to them. Reagan's talk of neoliberal populism was foundational to linking neoliberal right-wing politics to the business interests in its outcomes and to the workers' interests in its optics and image, leaving little to no organized resistance left to the right-wing regime. They say that the pendulum never gets stuck on one side. After all, it was only a matter of time before the Republicans lost another election, except the next time the pendulum swung, it found itself right back where it started. In this manner, what was to come in the 90s wound up being the perfect successor to Ronald Reagan, better than Bush Sr., better than any Republican could have ever been for the long-term dominance of the right-wing regime. After all, Bush Sr. never would have had any choice but to bow down to Reaganism. The political opposition, however, did have a choice. More police and punishment are important, but they're not enough. Because our story doesn't come close to stopping here. 
Today we looked at the beginning of and the solidification of the neoliberal regime. What we haven't looked at is the co-option of liberalism and a significant degree of left-wing imagery and discourse by this regime. Part 2 of this series is coming, and it will cover this issue. We'll go over in detail the answer to Reaganism by the opposition, the moment the American left lost any remaining institutional legitimacy, and the moment neoliberal populism went off the rails after essentially two decades of the government telling their people the social contract has to be dysfunctional, now swinging to the polar opposite, with the citizenry now force-feeding their elected representatives that very line, and with politicians and media pundits alike having no idea what to do with the Pandora's box they've opened. See y'all in part two.